Power CLI itself isn't a product. It actually sits on top of PowerShell. Um, PowerShell um, is a little something that Microsoft put together a few years back. Um, my take on PowerShell is essentially that, do you remember command.com, the command prompt? Um, <clears throat> I think of it as the guy has his face picked in the sand in the beach. Um, the Unix guy used to laugh at command.com as to what it can do. And so the engineers at uh, Microsoft came up with this new shell, PowerShell. In fact, quite a few people now use PowerShell instead of command.com to do things. Um, obviously, VMware, uh, they do their own thing. And what they've gone and done is added additional commands to PowerCLI that you can use. Hundreds, I've no idea how many, hundreds of them, okay? Um, I'll use it to automate builds. Um, it can also be used to script your environment. And by default, it doesn't really actually let you run scripts. Um, so the first thing you really need to get the hang of with PowerShell and PowerCLI is actually how to get it to run something in the first place, run a script anyway in the first place. It's got a series of execution modes, okay? As you can see here, restricted, all signed, remote signed, and unrestricted. I tend to use unrestricted. Um, that way I haven't got to worry about creating any signatures and things. Um, obviously, if you're in a secure environment, um, you might well go for all sign. So you create your scripts, you effectively create a, a hash of sorts that essentially stops people from messing with the code. Okay, um, that way you know that your scripts haven't been messed with, if someone runs you back, you know, a customer or someone uses it, um, you know it's the script that you wrote and not an altered script that they're using. Uh, remote side is just really handy um, if you're worried about people downloading scripts. Uh, they can only run local ones. Anyway, let's go a bit further. So how do you find out what execution policy you've currently got? It's quite easy. Um, it's just get execution policy. The example here has got restricted. In fact, when I go to do the demo, that's the way I'll start. Um, not a lot you can do with scripts at that point. You can change it. Um, most of the power CLI commands have kind of got gets and set pairs. Okay, so we've done and seen get execution policy. This is set execution policy. And uh, this particular example screen, they've got remote signs. You'll see me type unrestricted if you can type them anyway. Um, it will ask you, are you sure? Because you are effectively uh, opening it up from restricted to some other lower state. Um, if you're creating your own scripts, if I'm firing scripts to other machines, I occasionally stick like a minus four switch on the end. That way it won't ask me, um, won't ask the remote machine to ask me either, uh, which is handy if you're firing scripts to other machines. PowerShell itself, okay. Um, essentially, it's made up of, well, I call them verbs, uh, command lists that's written down here. So get service, we'll get a list of services. Um, it does have a series of switches, they put them parameters here. So minus name will be the name of the service you're looking for, and it's particular case, workstation. So the workstation service, um, so the thing allows you to connect the shares. Power CLI itself, you need to get hold of. Um, earlier today, I just picked up the link for 5.5. There's actually a release two uh, out at the moment. Um, <clears throat> if you want to know what updates there are to Power CLI, there is a blog blogs.vmwork.com slash powercli. And um, just because you've installed Power, PowerShell and PowerCLI, it doesn't mean you can actually use the command that we're using the scripts. And as you'll see when I show you the scripts, you have to basically add a snap in. Uh, it's like an include file, if you like. Uh, and that would be vmware.something. So vim automation core is the standard automation commands. Uh, the silently continuous handy for scripts. We don't really want to see what the method is. Particularly if you're rerunning a script for testing purposes, it'll say it's already loaded, so it continue gets rid of that kind of message. So how does PowerShell and PowerCLI work? It works with objects, things. <clears throat> These things can include virtual machines, which obviously you'll be using, uh, ESX, ESXi hosts, uh, data stores, I'll do a little bit on data stores, virtual switches, and clusters. Huge kind of bits and bobs that you have. And, uh, environment. The commandlets themselves 
uh, mostly gets and sets. That's mostly what I use. So if I want to find out something, it's get something, get VM. If I want to change something, it'll be set, so set VM. If I want something to appear, it's almost always new. It might be the odd ad, but new VM. Okay, and there are a few others sitting around there. So for example, new VM will allow you to move a virtual machine from folder to folder, or even data store to data store. How do you know what commandlets are out there? Okay, there are quite a few commands you can use, but including get help. Okay, that's sorry, that'll tell you about the command that you already know. Uh, if you want examples, I think examples are wonderful. Um, you can do get help, whatever the command is. So for example, new VM with examples. I'm just getting a few people saying that they can't hear me. Um, I'm hoping that's going to be sorted out yeah, in the background. Yeah, Okay, it's the communicate menu at the top that you want to play with. Okay, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, getting help. So, just the basic help, get help, new VM. A little bit more examples, uh, get help with examples. If you want the whole help to come out, get help, whatever the command is, dash full. If you just want to know what the commands are, which is what I meant to lead on, then get command, and it'll list loads and loads and loads and loads of commands. Or at least the current commands you've got if you've not done an else nothing. When you look at an object, for example, a virtual machine, um, it has attributes. Um, hell, no, a card's got an attribute, you know, it's color. So a virtual machine has an attribute. Arguably, its name is an attribute. The amount of memory it's got, that's another attribute. Okay, and so on. So one of the problems you'll have is, what can we mess with? What are the attributes that are out there? Um, this might be a little bit small, but basically this command's going to get VM and going to get member. When you stick get member on the end, it doesn't actually show you about the object in question. But it does show you what kind of attributes that you've got out there. Now, um, what you may or may not notice is that the first four methods, they, they do things, but the rest of them are properties. They are the kinds of things that you can look at, and quite a few of them that you can set. If I pick one at random, uh, about two-thirds of the way down the list, there's memory megabytes. Fun enough, it'll tell you how much memory the virtual machine's got in megabytes. It's not that hard once you get going. Getting going is the clever bit. In order to use the vSphere environment, well, just even using the normal tools. So if I'm using the vSphere client, I need to connect first. If I'm using the web client, I need to connect first. The same is true of PowerCLI. So it's just really PowerShell until you get connected. It's a nice, e easy command. It's connect bi server, okay. Uh, it's parameters the name of the machine you're connecting to. Um, if you have a Windows vCenter server and you happen to install Power, PowerShell and PowerCLI in the same box, quite frankly, you can just type connect bi server the name of the machine. It won't ask you for usernames and passwords because you're already on it and probably you've already got privileges. If you need to connect to someone else or particularly to a remote machine, Okay, you need to use uh, switches like username, user, administrator, password, VMware. Now I'm actually using an appliance, so you'll see in my demonstration that for the user group and password, VMware, but the idea is the same. Once you've done a connect, you can mess around with the vSphere environment or whatever the hell's already there. Now I use a training environment a lot and my little play thing here is another training environment. I don't have a certificate authority. So when I connect, I will tend to get certificate warnings, certificate errors. Um, if all you're doing is setting up scripts before the fact, probably just don't worry about certificate warnings. But obviously in a production environment, I would expect you to have some kind of certification in place, and very probably you won't get this. But we're forever breaking and making machines, so certificates will never keep up. So we tend to live with the um, certificate warnings. All right, let's do a demo. Right. Good. 
This is power CLI. I'm going to stick with it in the front. Okay, and one of the first things I do with power CLI is it's way too narrow. So I'm just going to make it a bit wider. Otherwise, I can never fit in when I need to tie it. Okay, a little bit wider now. You might notice the red writing at the top, and the reason there's red writing at the top. Now, my typing is a little bit iffy, so I quite like the tab key. When I do a tab key, it doesn't auto complete. Get execution policy will tell you the execution policy. Now, as you can see, it's currently restricted. Where does it get is normally a set. So I do a set execution policy, and I'm just going to dump it all the way down unrestricted. Okay, and I'll say yes. Okay, and if I repeat the get execution policy, you'll see it's unrestricted. It's not really a one time thing. If I open it up again, okay, you see there's no red writing this time. It's allowed to run the scripts, it's like a start up script in the background that nicely tells you a few of the commands. Okay, um, let's change the point back down again. And let's get connected. You'll find if auto complete doesn't work, you've made a little bit of a screw up somewhere. Uh, so I realized I haven't put the IT up on the end. And let's just wait for it to connect. It takes a little while first time. There we go. These are the certificate warnings that we were shown on the slide a little bit longer. And if I do a get be on host, there aren't any at the moment. There's nothing there. If I show you the environment I've currently got, it's empty. Uh, I'm going to go through some some examples of adding things in. Okay, but um, if I just quickly add any data center. Can you see it can see a data center called red? Okay, let's get rid of that one because I don't really actually want that to be red. I must admit, I don't tend to use the Power CLI little command box as a rule. What I tend to use is this little thing here, Power GUI. Uh, Power GUI, uh, we call it LSE, Language Sensitive Editor. Um, you can get it from well, PowerGUI.org, is where I actually live in the as well. But, um, if you follow the links, it'll take you to the download site. And um, as you can see, you can just download it and you down and just follow through on that. And when you use this particular tool, um, <clears throat> once you notice what the snap-ins are, it essentially will let you know if you're typing right, because it essentially color codes the writing. Okay. Also, you can debug, you can run by part, and you can see what you're up to as well. Um, you'll see more of this later on. And we'll go back to the slides now. Now, it's just a simple demo. Let's just do get commands. You can actually see that. There you go. Let's do that scroll around. And get dash help. Let's do a new data center. Just so it's different from the example in the slide. Right. Let's get back to the slide. This is originally one huge great set of slides, of, uh, sorry, uh, a series of slides. I've turned it to one huge great set of slides, but there's my name again. As well as connecting to the vCenter, you can actually connect to the host, which is what I'll be doing initially. Um, you can't really use a host with a vCenter server if the host itself communicates across the network. I suppose just installing or getting it to so far 
but uh, obviously you need switches for your virtual machines to use, port groups upon the switches for your virtual machines to connect to, and so on and so forth. So, first things first, if you're going to add a virtual switch to a to a host, you have to decide what NIC you're going to use with it. Okay, and it may well be that you've got an by a host. So one of the things you can do is this, this command here gets the host network um, on its own. We'll get the host networking for the currently connected host or the one it's been talking to. Um, if you've connected via the center server, it'll be the default host, whatever one that happens to be. Um, if you want to be a bit more specific, you can actually, just like Unix, I suppose, um, you can pipe through from one command to another. Now, one of the big differences between PowerShell and Unix shells is that the Unix shells, they pipe through strings. So it would be ESXi01, those letters. If I do a get VM host, ESXi01, and pipe that through to get VM host network, logically speaking, it's the actual object that goes through. It's the memory data structure that gets passed through from uh, one side of pipeline to the other. And then the get VM host network essentially interrogates the uh, data structure that describes ESXi01 and comes back with, well, the host networking in this particular case. If you're going to reuse scripts, and I do reuse scripts, um, use the variables is quite handy. This is just a string variable called VM host, uh, which means I can keep referring to it further down the script. This is just a one line there. So get VM host, the VM host, the ESXi01 with passport local. Okay, we're piping that object through to get the host network. Okay, and that comes back with a series of columns. It may not be the columns you're interested in, or maybe too many columns. So one of the things that you can do is select or select object, you can show not to select. Okay, and they're specifically showing host name and virtual switch, as opposed to anything else that might come back from that particular command. Sometimes it doesn't tell you enough. So it might tell you that it's got NICs. You want to know about the network cards, okay? And um, the select object expand property, the minus sign on the end there, that's actually in front of expand property, will allow you to kind of look at the attributes of the attributes, method over, if you prefer. So for example, it may well say it's got three network cards, but you might want to know what the, well, the main thing are, but you might want to know what uh, the MAC address and things are. So what they've gone and done is, what we've gone and done here is to expand the property to turn the three into the actual three objects. And um, the three objects we're interested in, or the objects that we're interested in are the physical NICs, and there are the three down there, the NICs 0, 1, and 2. And I think I've got three NICs on the house as well, so they'll kind of look like that um, when we do the demo. Okay, right, so it's all well and good knowing what network class you've got, but the matter whether you're used by something, and one of the things you have to watch out for, particularly if you're using command line, you don't tend to get a lot of the friendly, please don't do that messages from the command line, is that uh, you can actually nick nicks, you can steal a network card from one virtual switch to another. Network cards can't actually be used by more than one virtual switch at one point. So in this particular example, We've got the usual get host, VM host, we're getting the VM host network, okay, we're getting the object virtual switch, okay, and we want to know are there any NICs on the existing virtual switches. Um, if it's a default install, there'll only be vSwitch 0, and if it's a default install, the very first NIC will be uh, the one in use. So if you look here, vSwitch 0, VM NIC 0, and if I go back a few slides, we've got VM NICs 1 and 2. So uh, ignoring any kind of, kind of IP address issues, uh, we've got VMNX 1 and 2 to play with. Don't mess around with VMNX 0 unless you want to make your EFX on host on deck. So how do you create a new switch? It's really easy. It's new dash virtual switch. Um, if you're using um, Power BI, uh, once you type, start typing new dash, you'll get a little list of things coming up. And similarly, from the PowerShell front, um, you do new dash and just press tab lots of times. It is quite hard, the alphabet. You'll eventually get new virtual switch. 
There are some parameters you must pass. You've got to say what host the switch is going to go on to, and it needs to know what it's called. One of the big issues you have to watch out for um, when you're command line creating switches, or pass CLI or, or whatever you're using, you can actually call a switch anything you like. It doesn't have to be little v, big s, which, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You could call it a production switch. You can just call it a single word. It doesn't matter what you call it. Um, it does mean that it won't match the standard naming convention used by the, the graphical interfaces. But it is handy to make them look different or to make them stand out. So you might call it like the ice scuzzy switch or I don't know, the V motion switch or I think it's called full court motion, that kind of thing. So in this particular example, okay, we've already connected the host, we're not showing that as well. Okay. Um, we've got the networking. Okay. Um, physical NIC one is the second NIC. So it starts from zero, then one and two and so on. Okay, so uh, the NIC zero is in use, so the first three ones will be NIC number one, the second NIC. Okay. So we're creating a new switch called vSwitch01, which happens to match the naming convention of the GUI. And we're adding a NIC called dollar PNIC. Well, looking back, dollar PNIC is the second NIC, so that's VM NIC1. Uh, you have to know it's known, you can just put VM NIC1. Unlike the GUI, uh, you can actually create a switch. Uh, so if I don't put minus NIC on them, I can create a switch that internal only with no port books. The most redundant switch you'll ever see. Uh, no port groups, no ports, nothing connect to it. Uh, no uplinks because there's no NICs connected to it. So um, you basically have to break it down. You create the switch, you add the NIC on this type of one hit. And then once you've done that, you add a port group in this particular case of production. Uh, the examples I'm using here, they kind of match the installed config course. I teach it a lot, so I know what basically goes on in that, so it's easy for me to come up with names from a course and think up names myself. So, um, we're getting switch one, because we have to say what switch the port group is to be created on. The new command down here is new virtual port group. Um, you have to say what it's called. You have to say what switch it's going to go on, and that's all I've put down here. There are other optional parameters that you can put on. Uh, for example, the VLAN. Uh, it's quite common these days for networks to be VLAN, obviously, uh, bear that in mind. It's not just port groups that you're going to add to a switch. One of the other things you might do is to add a kernel port. And again, this is where the command line differs very, very differently from the GUI. Um, if I've got an existing switch, I can do new kernel port. And I name it and it adds it because you have to it. Um, if I want to do that from the command line, including Power for your life. So, um, you basically what you have to do first, you don't have to create a port group. And once you've got the port group, you essentially convert it into a kernel port with new VM host network adapter. So if you look at the managed parameters, we have VM host, so what box is it on? The virtual switch, what switch is it on? And the port group, it converts a previously existing port group into, you'll see this in a minute, in, into a kernel port. In this particular example, what we've got down here. So, um, VM host network adapter on 01, port group called, I don't know, whatever the port group's called, P notion. Virtual switch, I don't know, 0102. IP address, uh, 172.20.13.51. That's the address I can't use the notion. Okay, subnet mask, uh, class C. And as you can see, the motion label colon true. Just like when you do it from the GUI, by default, it's not a management port, it's not a motion port, it's not a full tolerant port. Uh, they are other things that you can enable. Um, make sure you create the right kind of kernel port, otherwise it doesn't really do what you want it to do. Don't worry, there's a demo coming up at the end here. You might not have got everything you want on the switch, so as well as, maybe back here, New virtual switch. You can change things on it with set, get and set, but look at it, set, change things. Again, you have to say upon which host, okay, that's just been passing it through with a pipe here, and which switch you're talking about. And this particular case, um, we're setting the maximum sample unit or transmission unit to 9000. So again, another common thing you might want to do is switch on jumbo points. Remember, it's got to work end to end. 
not just your own. So um, if it all goes horribly wrong in death and you set the uh, MCU to 9,000, so it might bounce to 100, maybe it'll talk again. So let's, let's do a bit of a demo. Um, what I'll start with, let's share my desktop first. I'll move this down. I'm going to use Power Guru, it's a little bit easier. And I've got some scripts that you previously played, it makes it a little bit easier to demo. Um, what I'll start with, actually, is this one here, which wasn't in a series of slides, but it was useful to know. Um, this is the thing at the top here that makes the commands work, our PS mapping. Without that, it doesn't understand Connect BI server and the rest of it. Okay. Um, normally, when I write a script, there's loads of gets and hide as I go through. So, um, if I just get it connected to start with, and as you can see, we get certification error. Now, if I go to the host, which is over here somewhere, this is the hosting question 51. And if I go to DNS and routing, it's got a stupid name and things. I thought I'd quickly show you uh, that. Um, you don't actually have to quickly go on the hosting channel, you can do it remotely. Uh, I've already set a static address, I don't really want to go through all that. Um, but what it hasn't got is a decent name and, and things here. Okay. So if you look down here, um, this is how I've got the host network as it's done. So it's got local host, it's got local domain. Quite frankly, it doesn't know anything else. Okay. And if I just run the next few. Lines. A little bit fussy sometimes, but it should work. And what I'll do, I'll just scroll off to that. Okay, so um, picking up the context of the host network, so the networking for ESX R01, it's in that screen at the top here. We're setting the DNS address to 2010, which happens to be the default data as well. We're setting the domain name to be class up local, so it might some slides, and the search for the name for the same thing. So if it puts the thread, it knows it's thread that will be class up local. And I've asked for its name to be set to ESX IO1. Yes. Okay, so if I go in here, as you can see, it's all changed. Nice and easy, not too hard. Uh, obviously, when you're testing, you tend to run things by parts. Notice the debug menu, it's got execute selection. Okay. Uh, I just press the play button, it runs the whole lot. Doesn't really like connecting twice. Okay, so if I now just disconnect, I can click on it all now. All right, I'm no longer connected. As a matter of point, by the way, because uh, I've been messing around with this, you can undo it all. So as you can see, reuse scripts, why not? Um, placeholder IP address 40, you can't find a blank screen. It, if you try and send a blank string, it says you've not sent anything. And the original name and things were local domain and local host, and the kernel gateway all zeros again, so effectively one separate. But the thing I showed you in the slides was actually creating a switch, and my typing's pretty horrendous, so I'm going to choose a little bit there. Okay, so add prod. And if you go to networking, Always, when I write scripts, I tend to have the VPA file and all the other open, open so I can see what's going on. So if you look over here, it's nothing that's not uh, It's got the standard thing. So it's got the VM network, credit install. It's got the network, network, I it can connect in the first place. It's got one VM, probably using the other one. But it doesn't have a network production machine, or whatever I want it to be for. Now, you've already seen, where's it gone? New virtual switch. Okay, there's the name of the switch, we switch one, then the next, the next one. Okay, and I can connect it to the SXIO one, which is the one I'm connecting to. Okay, uh, get the context of the switch, and then upon that, I'm going to basically create a port called call production. The advantage of me laying out like this is I can copy and paste this into another script and change the port group name at the top nice and easy. You can even create a function if you really wanted to, but basically a one line or so it's quite a lot of time. I'll just run this in Mongo. So yeah, you can run a script all in Mongo. And if I move over here, okay, you can see it's created the switch and then there's the port group. 
it does one and then the other. And if I wanted to, I could edit the settings of the assigned so why not? It is a function for Okay. I've shown you a script that creates the thing. Um, I've got scripts that do everything. Uh, it's just the way I was working when I was writing the scripts. So you might as well see, also see the script on above it. It's very similar. So if I just go to move prod, there it is. So again, use a bit at the top, same bit there. Next. The only real difference is remove virtual switch. Okay. Um, when you create the switch, you can say what more, what port group, whatever else you can click on it. When you remove it, whatever's on it goes to. So I didn't need to put it off, but I didn't need to remove the port group first and remove the net and then remove the switch. They will all go in one go. Notice I've got this confirm false. If you don't do that, someone's got to type Y. Uh, and in automation script, you really can't have to type Y. So confirm false is quite a useful formula. And sometimes it might be a false, uh, just to force it through. What other things could it come up to? Right, so currently on this, we've just got the on port group. Okay. What I'm going to do next um, is to add a kernel port to the switch. Okay. And again, I'm going to cheat. I've got a switch here. Um, my typing is really slow, so just speaking out a little bit. So, um, I call it something really clever. I put my port. There we go. <coughs> and again, notice the way it looks. Look the same. I always like a standard layout because that way when I look at it, I can tell straight away if I've messed up. So again, we've got the host name, we've got the port group. Remember what I said earlier, you create a port group and then you turn it into a, a kernel port. In fact, I'll actually run it by parts. You can see that. So what I'll do is I'll start by just come up here. I'll well just do that one right here. And just to remind you, go back here. We've got vSwitch1, uh, sorry, vSwitch0. Okay, it's got one port group and one kernel port. Okay, so let's get the context of vSwitch0. And then I'm going to create a new port group on it called Happy Storage. So I'll just run those two lines. Uh, at this point, it's very similar to the prod one earlier. And if we go back to this line here, okay, you can see it says it's, it there? it's a virtual machine port group. Okay, just like this thing down here. In fact, if I really wanted to right now, okay, not that I really want to do it. I could actually attach the VM to it and do that. And then as an extra step, then as an extra step, you then convert it effectively into a kernel port. And scroll over so you can see what's there. So on this host, on that port group, on that switch, and kernel ports have to have an IP address, so 61. Okay, and a passing mask. I just run this a little bit. And I'm not going to go fast enough, but if you look, there's it done. You can see it now says it's a kernel port. Okay, like I said, you create the port group first, and then you convert it into a kernel port with appropriate parameters. So um, IP address and all that kind of thing. And you know, once you finish the map, you can just connect. Okay. Uh, what the house just for just just for the hell of it? Uh, stick a VMotion port on it, although the other machine hasn't actually been set up properly yet. So uh, we've got a VMOT in it somewhere. Uh, add VMotion. And again, you'll see it looks very similar. Uh, I really do believe in reusing code. So add PS mapping to get the context of the command, host name, port group name, connect as usual. I'll run this one in one go. Okay. So this time it's vSwitch2, it'll be a NIC2, and that was just can't play with each other. Um, get the switch context, create a port group called vMotion. And we ask it that's an any convention. And then actually it should be a 13 machine. Okay, think it's a 13. Okay. Um, set the IP address, and as you can see here, there's the motion. Okay, if I hold my mouse over this. You can see there's quite a few things that you can actually set. 
fault tolerance logging enabled, uh, SMIP v6 stuff, management traffic enabled. So they're the basic tick boxes that you have. Okay. And if you look over here, it's true. So you can actually switch them on. And if you use using set, you can actually switch them on. Let's run this one in one here. Let me see if I can get that. Okay, so again, it's ready to switch, it's going to have a port group, okay, and turn it to a kernel port. It's definitely a series of steps that you do. And when you're writing scripts, um, always do it in a logical sequence, the same logical sequence, always do things in the same order. Um, it makes it a lot easier to debug, and you can recognize you made a script, but not your other scripts that way. Okay, I'll do this little bit of a demo. I'll put that to some more slides. Storage. Uh, I don't have a spare local day store, but I do have an NFS box out there. So, um, how do you add an NFS data store? It's new data store. New data store can actually add local data. Okay, um, SAN disks, if, if you're connected to SAN, although you actually have to configure a SCSI first. Okay, and the magic parameters are obviously the machine you're on, okay, what you're going to call the data store, what you're going to connect to, and the path over there. Uh, some people have their NFS servers with some kind of arbitration of sorts, you might be using them for half of it, didn't set that. Okay, so let's have a bit of an example down here. Again, same box. New data store, NFS, okay, as opposed to a local data store. It's very similar to the GUI, uh, just to remind you, in the GUI, when you go to storage, when you do an S4, if you don't say otherwise, it's a local or, or SAN disk, you're going to do NFS, basically you have to override it. Okay, and the same is true with new data store. The host you're connected to, the name of the thing you can, uh, sorry, the name of the data store, um, I'm going to call it shared. It's, would have been shared. And the path over there, uh, it's not the path I'm going to use. Uh, I've got a bit carried away with the path. Uh, it wouldn't fit on the slides. Okay, and uh, the MFF host, although I'm not actually called that, I changed my mind about the suffix since I've got this slide. Let's suppose you've got a data store and it's got a dark name. Um, you might have propagated loads and loads and loads and loads of the FF hosts, or maybe they've all got data store one. So one of the things you can do uh, with a get, you can quite often set one of the attributes that you can get. Uh, so when I do a get data store, one of the attributes is the name. Um, this particular example is actually choosing by name, so if I do the get data store minus name data store, it, it'll just talk about that specific one. Uh, set data store will change things. There's not a lot you can change, but one of the things you can change is its name. Okay, quite handy sometimes, uh, particularly if you need to create some systematic naming convention and uh, whoever automated or manually installed your boxes and stuff like that box didn't do that. Or your script wrong, you need to change it after the file. Uh, that's another way of doing it. Okay. Um, Currently, uh, I've got no host connected in my VC, but I might have several. Okay. Um, in which case, what I would need to do, oh, that's what I mean, okay. what I need to do is to specify uh, the specific thing. So, I'll go back here. Um, if I just did a get, a get data store, set data store minus name local 01, arguably, it'll try and set all of them to local 01. So one of the things you really must make sure when you're writing scripts is that it's not really a wildcard. You don't wildcard as such. Um, you actually alter, add, remove, delete, whatever. The thing that you mean to is a bit embarrassing otherwise. And be very, very, very careful, uh, obviously, about the main management network um, because, you, of course, you can uh, accidentally make yourself go network death or at least make the host or the VC go network death if you're not careful. I don't often use this anymore, um, but um, it is quite useful for copying ISOs in. Um, you can actually mount 
um, uh, a host data store as a, as a local folder, in effect. In this particular example, <coughs> sorry about that, um, the data store in question is <coughs> shared. Okay. okay. And um, the local name we're going to call it is VMFS. I don't know if you can see that. That's just, just down there. And um, it's a BIM data store, uh, or BI, virtual infrastructure data store. Some of the names that BI still to left over. The old name for vSphere was virtual infrastructure. If you see like BI anything, that's that's always mixed around. Okay. Uh, we're going to the root of that particular data store. So when I do a CD BMF, it goes to the root of shared. Okay. Let's do a demo. Now short demo with that. So if I share my desktop. Here we are again. Um close all the way. Close all the way. And yes, it's a good chance. And what we'll do is again one I collected earlier. Okay, and that's the So This is what I was talking about earlier. I got a bit carried away um, <laughs> with the naming convention for the path. Uh, so, note the file, and every time I ask my parents, I'll put on the box share the name, but I will do that. But what the hell? Okay. So, again, um, when I do a connect, I'm still talking locally of business BC stuff in depth. Um, so, the name machine you're connecting to, okay, for the Connect VI server. When you're doing a new data store, you have to say what host it's on. Well, luckily, it's someone with more people. Okay, if there's only one host, I'm connecting directly without that. Okay, uh, the name that you want to call it. Okay, so I want to call it share, it might be like point server or, or something like that. Uh, where is it? Okay, so um, we've got the NFS host, that machine it's on. So we have that. Um, there we go. Uh, NFS will be plus that local. And the path on it. That horrid little path. Um, it actually takes a little while to fire up, so it'll be one of these times we've actually see what do stuff. So, uh, it's in the process of creating the NAS data store down here. Maybe a little pregnant pause for a sec. And there she is, and then I just move that out again. So, NFS speed bus that local, and uh, Horrid, horrid, horrid path. And if I browse the data store, there's nothing on it at the moment. Okay. Um, again, you can add data stores, you can also remove them. Be a little bit careful when you remove them. Okay, uh, with NFS data stores, uh, which is safe to remove, that's what I'm doing with the demo. Okay. Okay, it's moved data store. If I hold my mouse over this, okay. Um oh run a sync's quite useful, as you can. Run a sync is quite useful. Um if I'm doing a lot of things and I don't need to wait wait from one by one, uh run a sync's quite useful. Okay. Um just be aware that if I do remove data store to real data store, it will delete the data. But for uh, uh, NFS file, it's essentially an unmount. Wish I could do a remount. So, for example, I might want to make it read only or unread only, so I'd unmount it and remount it the other way. Um, I won't change its name because <laughs> almost script the that it was shared. But if I really wanted to, I could connect from here uh, to the SXI box and do. Uh, oh, what the hell? Um, Uh, cheat with a disconnect. I can bring up what one I actually did connect to. Um, I'm typing something. But okay, it's just if I'm doing demos with uh, big old scripts. Uh, I could have done a get data store just to see what data stores are out there. In fact, if I do a Let's see. Oh, let me type while I'm doing it. But uh, what I could do, if I just stop sharing, I'm just going to type something really quick. 
I have not borrowed you too much, but you know, I love this kind of thing. I'm a bit geeky when it comes to this kind of stuff. Right. Services. Okay. I haven't got a script that does this particular one, but um, here we go. Um, one of the things that you should really have set on uh, your ESXi host uh, is NTP, for example. And you might want to know for starters if it's running. Okay, so this is the list of services. We've got uh, the MOV PXA, which is what the vCenter talks to, and MPDD, MTPD, uh, which is the NTP demon. Uh, I really wanted to try to narrow it down to a specific server. Okay. Um, but one of the things you can do is start service, set service, you can show them first point to say. Let's get past one slide. Okay. One of the things you might find useful uh, when you do get, so this is if you do on and on, but when you do get is um, you might want to filter it. So you might want to just show the VM whose name is begin with V or whatever. Um, this particular one is just a directory listing. The mode thing is at Linux. So um, D means directory. So um, if it's D dash 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 dash, it is exactly okay. Uh, this kind of directory. You can also do like minus like. So I do things like minus like. Uh, D asterisk and things beginning uh, with D. Um, okay. What can we do? Uh, I mentioned like. Okay. Uh, there's less than and greater than, equal. There's not equal to, obviously. Um, there's not like, and so on and so forth. Uh, standard thing with um, less than, that's uh, like with uh, comparisons. Try and make sure that the amount of objects that come back, things that come back is minimum. It speeds things up. Uh, there is a maximum size somewhere hard coded in PowerShell for the buffer, so you don't really want to overdo it. You've got like 10,000 VM, which is the maximum, and it may well uh, cause a few problems with your, with your sort. Here we go, start. Okay, so again, uh, we've already done a connect. Um, so uh, get VM host service, okay. Where it's key, that's its name, um, is basically NTBD. Okay, so we've got the context of the service. So obviously, the service itself doesn't fit inside a variable, it's the variable structure that describes it as well. And then when I do a start service, I'm actually saying the service that's been picked up on the line above. Uh, there's also restart. Yeah, restart okay, and stop. Okay, which I've got a slide for. If I'm messing around with NTP, I might not be the first one to mess around with NTP, so it's probably a good idea to find out what's out there first. Okay, so in this particular example, again, get the host, get the host NTP server, we get the list of the currently configured NTP servers. If nothing comes back, that's when you may well want to play around with adding VM host NTP server. Okay. So like NTP, so NTP server example the local or UK dot something other dot org, whatever one I normally use. And uh, you've probably got your own one with a bit of luck. Okay. And at that point you'd then need to restart the server once you've changed that. And you've already seen restart on the top of the slides. Never the one you put it back, go back to restart. Okay. So, um, I've done bits of this already, so I'll we'll call on. The end. Yes, you can create virtual machines. Okay. Um, 
I won't do a live UVM because then I have to install an operating system and it's just probably too long. Okay, but it's new VM and then it's name. That's basically it. The host it's on and the name of the machine. Um, just about everything will be wrong if you do that. But quite frankly, you need to put a lot more parameters on. Okay, so um, you saw earlier, uh, I think it was get VM with a get number, what the parameters were. They basically line up with the, the set and the new. Um, watch out for the units. These are megabytes, and we tend to think in gigabytes a lot these days. Uh, don't type in two or something silly like that, or I have no, no memory. Um, WinNet standard guess is 2003. Uh, if you look in the help, uh, it's online, it's great. Um, it'll tell you what the various special keywords for the new DOS ID is. It's a bit of like you won't be pressing 2003, it'll be 2009, but I just wanted a nice small VM as my example. Okay. You have to say, don't have to, but you should say which data store it's on, what network it's on, and so on. Okay, nice and easy thing. Probably though, if you're alternating, you've got a template around. Okay, so, uh, or you want to use a template. In this particular example, uh, new templates actually uh, is clone to a template. Uh, as you'll see in my script, I think I'll that bit on. So new templates or clone uh, custom VM. So a template called my template and put it in a data center called my DC. It'll not be any particular folder. Um, you can actually put it in a specific folder if you want. And the example I've got actually does that. Uh, once you've got your templates, uh, if you're going to deploy from a template, you obviously will not want all to be called the same thing. So you'll probably want to create a Operating system customization spec. Okay. And uh, lots of parameters for that one. Many parameters is what you're going to call it, who's with it, and whether it's going to be for a domain or work, but it's Windows one. Um, but admin password, product key, that kind of thing. Usual kind of stuff in there. Once you've got your template and your customization spec, you can deploy. Okay. I'm um, pre assuming that it was 2003, for example. But you've already uploaded the um, SysPrep files. Um, if it's 2008 or later, that's not an issue. Um, I forgot that at one point today, so I had to quickly copy those on. Uh, so this will create a virtual machine called VMTL1 from a template called My Template, and I can put one on there, on a specific host, like okay, ESXIO1, and using the customization spec, my spec. You will actually see this happen shortly. Okay, so don't worry, it's not all just looking at slides. Um, there's no power on on that one. So one of the things you need to be able to do is to power on. Uh, if you're going to turn a machine into a template, switch it off or shut it down. Probably better to shut down. And you can suspend and politely suspend as well. So it's quite a few past that things you can do it here. And uh, if you're stopping a VM, uh, use the minus confirm false thing again. Otherwise, I'll ask you uh, I'm sure. Um, it might not be right. Um, so one of the things you can do is change parameters like memory megabyte. Okay, so uh, increase the memory. You can't decrease the memory. Okay, from whatever number it is to five twelve. And you can also that's essentially changing the hardware, isn't it? How much memory? Okay. You can also add hardware, new disk, quite a common thing to add, or new network card, that kind of thing. Uh, again, watch out for units. Big long number. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, six, and gigs. Okay, so it's going to be dry. Uh, calculator time if you're not careful. Okay, and minus data source, so the one that passed that time, and it's creating it on share. You can also run scripts within VM. Uh, I don't do that that often, but uh, sometimes. Okay, so again, what's the VM on how you got the lab for it, so has credentials. Previously created, yes, potential, previously created, and then um, something that PowerShell does, so get process, not bad, get process. Um, what I have found um, um, is that I typically have to also bar through uh, set execution policy, okay, and you can use semicolon, more than one command in the line. That's different from a pipe, okay, it's one command, semicolon, add that open bundle another command. 
and do set execution policy on top of it. Okay, minus false. Okay, then pipe some horrid command that's going to change something physical in the operating system, and I won't get the you're not allowed to do that kind of error. Okay, for this particular one, I just look for a process called a notepad. Once it's got the contact, stops it. Nice easy one. Uh, that's actually PowerShell rather than PowerCLR. But if they've installed PowerCLR on the box in question, you can do full blown PowerCLR. So you could sit on a I don't know, Windows 7 box up on there. Uh, uh, instructions to some other box that's got PowerShell installed, okay, and make it do so. Um, I have been known to do that. To sometimes uh, if I'm teaching uh, with more number of students and some of the labs are impaired, or I can use it to actually do the other students' labs. Okay, you can also invoke a script. Okay, all right, and you can actually tell what kind of script as well and all sorts of scripts. All sorts of parameters. I couldn't parameters. I can't get a lot. Okay. Plus, you can move a VM from one point to another. Okay. So that's a view motion on the particular point. Uh, Desktop motion also takes folder. So it's the same uh, basic command: um, move VM, whether or not you're moving between hosts, move from folder from point. Um, of course, data store between data store. The syntax isn't in all ways very nice, but there you go. Um, can you see the round brackets here? Uh, the round brackets basically um, is get the results of the command inside there, but just give me the results. Um, otherwise, I'd have to do something like um, dollar desk equals get one whole server one and put a minus destination dollar desk or something. So you don't actually need to use variables if you really hate things. Uh, but you know, they are useful. I like them. Okay. Right. In this particular example, uh, we've got the context for the host. Let's say about five hosts. So ESX01. Uh, we're going to get a VM. Now, if you notice, between get VM and the pipe, there's nothing. So that's all the virtual machines on that specific host. Okay. Now, uh, the motion migration is only the motion if it's powered on. So the filter here is looking for the power state to be powered on. Okay, so essentially it's getting the list of all the powered on VMs on the FX one. Uh, just be a bit careful, you can do really long pipelines if you're not careful. And then move to the end, minus destination to the other box. Okay, and that will move them all to the other box. Um, pretty much assuming that they're emotional. It's not going to magically disconnect the CDs or uh, move their storage from local to shared or anything like that. So, uh, I mentioned storage remotion. Okay, so if you look, same command, move VM. But this time it's the minus data store uh, switch. I'm not convinced uh, that just having move VM for all kinds of moves is the cleverest idea. Um, usual of fun with any kind of program thing is you know, one tool, one thing. Uh, but if you compare it to the migration wizard, it does all of that. Well, it doesn't do a move between folders particularly, but it does all the rest. Uh, so I'm guessing they're trying to make it on par with that. So it's going to move it from wherever the hell it is, okay, to shared. Okay, um, you could have done a get VM, uh, pipe it through where look, the data store they're on, I don't know, private, and then just move those ones to share. You could actually do it that way as well. So I move from one specific data store to another. Now, um, I don't know if it shows up in there, haven't yet. When something's passed through and you need to remove the first of it, whatever it is, um, it's a dollar underscore. So in this particular case, unless you've only got one thing in it, DIR is return lots of things. Okay? This particular one just says their name. But um, what this will do is for each, so it does, so it's five things. One at a time, each of the five things, okay, and dollar underscores the it, and dot name is the the parameter or attribute of the name. This actually just will print out a list of the names of the files in that particular directory. Now, if I've done, I don't know, um, it's pretty pointless with uh, names of things most of the time, um, but quite often I'm, I know I'll read some. 
list of parameters from a CSV. Okay, so I don't know, 100 lines. And then I'll do a for each, okay? And the dollar underscore refers to effectively the line of the CSV. And uh, the dot name, that will be the column title of the uh, column in the CSV, okay? Uh, watch out for case. I've been caught out by case. And my typing's a bit random sometimes. So if in a CSV name spelt with a lot of case, then actually done it here as well. Always assume everything's case sensitive, and it's like so much easier. But anyway, you can use that to pass a file and make it create loads of, I don't know, VMs in a specific way, or create a sort of specific way, or um, series of switches across hosts and all sorts. You can particularly go mental with that. If you don't use CSVs, if you use XML, you can go multi-dimensional. Okay, so you can uh, have a, a main main loop in the XML, so a main series of things which are hope within it, a series of things which are the switches within it, a series of things which are the attributes if you really wanted to. I'm not a great fan of XML, but you, know, you can do that kind of thing. So, a little bit more information which I think I mentioned more than once in this one. Um, if you want to know a little bit more, okay, there's get view. And if you want to know something a little bit more about that, there's expand property. We saw that earlier, I think. Okay, this is the configuration. So, and this particular page tells you about the tools. Uh, not sure that 8194 means much to anyone, but it'll tell you what version of VMware tools is on the VM. Handy sometimes uh, you're wanting to advise that VM not looking for the not to it once. Now it's a bit bitty, but maybe it's not the latest version of VMware tools. Uh, there's actually a command that to upgrade VMware tools as well. So you could use that, compare it against the tools version against a number. If they're not equal to, uh, do an upgrade VMware tool. Uh, when you do the output, okay, um, you don't actually have to make it text. Okay, in this particular example, it's got convert to HTML and it'll to get out to a file, okay, uh, CSV, I love CSV, okay, or grid view, grid view's quite powerful. Um, if I just show you that right now, looks like I might be typing in a minute. Right. And she ended up seeing so I'm not typing. Right. Big demo time. So far, obviously, if you're looking at the host, uh, very properly, you've got a vCenter server. Well, I've got a vCenter server. There it is. Nothing in it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to DataCenter, I'm going to add folders, I'm going to add um, the host to it, and I'm going to mess around some VM stuff. So, you can see all the kind of stuff you typically do. And again, why not shoot the file for this? So, let's just close all of this and then open up. Start with data center. And you saw me type this earlier. New data center, give it the name. Okay, that basically just uh, angles it to the root of the view. I'm just going to watch that. That's the one by parts last time. Okay, uh, and if I go into the VC, there's training. Nice and easy. Okay. And if I now create folders, you might just see all the stuff you can do with it. So I'll hold it. And I'll slow down on this one. So, uh, usual thing at the top, with the connect, new folder. Okay. Um, if you don't say otherwise, it's things to put it in post and proxy. Um, I like the old clients, so that's yellow folder. Uh, if you want it anywhere else, you have to basically tell it. Okay. So, uh, within training, which is the data center, just go to VM is the VM templates. Okay. Um, I'll just run this in one go and then we'll show you it again. So that's set the yellow folder. Okay, and if I go to VM templates, there they are. Okay. Um, if I hand the puts, let it down here. Let's have a bit here. Location. Um, that'll be yellow. It'll be in hosting clusters. It'll be wrong. 
Okay. What else do we do? Add a house, don't we? So, let's add the house. Okay. I actually do have two hosts, but I know that one to finish another minute. So, now it's an easy add house. I'm using variable names, that way I can mess around if I change my mind about what I'm going to call you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to stick them below lab server because it's neat. Okay, username group, password, or you can call CV and then bang. And yeah, don't ask me any questions. Okay, so if I run this, and go back here. It's still static, but I've got to have some plastics in the Okay, just like we're doing normally. Uh, yes, XIO1 does actually have the one. Uh, Okay, and then number two will be added. Assuming the top of the Until that turns green again, I've not finished. I'm not quite sure. I'm going Um, if you do it from the command line, so the vSphere client command line, you do get some of the past there as well, but not so. Really. I do like the power deal. So, uh, I've got a VM, it's off, uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn it into a template. Um, I can show you, okay, uh, I think I have the original idea I had was to do a client for template, and then I did it on this machine that just took too long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it from wherever the hell it is now. Have a look. It's got a bunch of machines because I didn't specify where to put the VMs when I joined it. Okay. So basically it's going to move the bunch machine from there to there and convert it to the template. That's the pattern. Okay. So let's have a look. So move again. Save the VM. Get the destination. There's only one folder called template, so it's nice and easy to find. And you saw new templates on the slides earlier. Set VM has got a two template. It's also set template to VM. Um, if I have an undo for this bit. Okay. And that essentially go one way and then the other way. Right. So let's go one way first. If I go across here. Okay. So it moved it. And then next we can put in the box and turn it to the template. Okay. Once so I've got the template. Okay, I'm going to deploy from it, but quite frankly, I'm going to custom spec. So, let's just type in that. So, I'll call it something. There we go. Now, this is the one that's the real reason why. Not really done, I'm this one's really long. So, new OS custom spec, and as you can see, lots of parameters. I'm going to call it Win2 K3 stuff, I hope you all call it that in the deploy. Okay, operating system type window. Um, you should come set up and you create it, I'll show you what it's like. So, pass it over and I'll pass it over now. Product key, I'm going to do a quick box now. Let's <laughs> make my seat. Set the um, admin password to VMware and work it to work. I could have added it to the name, I'll call it in the um, If you don't specify a naming convention, it's same with VM. Um, so if I actually just run this. Okay. Oops. I thought we'd get rid of the previous one. Because of course, I checked them out for this. I'll go ahead and that first. That is that. It's really quick. Okay, and if I go to custom step for this, and if I go to edit, this you can see, so there's the name, there's the organization. Because I didn't say it shows that one, but I'm going to put the key in, put the password in. Okay, I didn't tell it what to do about the time zone, so I should probably change that. Okay, what command to run once? Maybe I'm going to do a DC promo or something. 
Okay, that's one of the networks. I didn't set that, but they do exist. There's the work group, okay, in the lower case, because I typed it in, and of course I asked it to put in the two. Once I've got that, I can deploy from it. So let's deploy. And slam yourself down again, if you have the time. The keyboard's working again now, so there we go. <clears throat> so, I'm just going to connect the BI server, and I'll do it back out. And we're there. Because uh, I want to show you something. It's not so completely lovely. Yeah, just run that a little bit there. Get data center, and I actually need to pop it by the score, just by the entry. Obviously, it's lovely if it does what you want it to do, isn't it? Right, that's a good station. You see, it's listed them all, regardless of the host. Okay. So, um, if I wanted them, this is what, just going back slightly further. So, if I do a block, the on host, um, ESX, uh, one put a switch in, it should be okay. Um, Oh, what the hell did it do there? Um, local. And I'll type that through the page still. Okay, and shows data store one shell, then shows data store two. And if I go to hosting clusters in a second, and go to configuration storage, that's data two as opposed to that one. So, uh, I'll just show you earlier. In fact, I really wanted to do that. I can do a remote thing. All right. So, new virtual machine. I'm going to call it demo one. Okay. It's going to be based on a template called template. I think the template's cool. Let's double check everything. No trust anything. Yes, it is. Okay. It's on the host one, which it was. The base for, which is currently actually shared. And the custom specs, that custom spec looks all right. Um, it won't start it, so um, <clears throat> because I've not done the first one in sync, it will sit around and wait. And unfortunately, probably you hope. Okay, and so it's going to be a little bit faster. Short sure, slightly better. Okay, that's demo one. That's it, watch the end, never finishes the that one again. Let's wait for that. I did do the clone live. It will trade it, it will start it. I'm going to show you what works. Okay. One of the reasons why people, I'm not this with my pad on, okay. One of the reasons why people sometimes get interested in PowerShell. Um, isn't because they're interested in PowerShell, it's because they're doing the VCAP with that. Um, but as people know, that's the only reason why they're interested in that. Um, and there are certain things that, although I've mentioned it in passing, that get handy to, to know how to do. And that's uh, what I'm trying to type it down. So <clears throat> while that's still running, I'm still probably do a few things as a misfit or run it for one. So um just a few bits. Okay, expand property network advantages to adapters. Um this is looking within the guest. So expand property disks. What does the C drive look like as opposed to disk zero, which we'll see from outside. 
uh, also tool driver. This is the convert to HTML, which will appear down there. Pretty straightforward because you can choose what it shows. But um, if you intend to do um, any kind of advanced exam, uh, VMS seems to have a fixation with CD. So um, let's talk about CDs for a minute. Um, assuming you connect it, which we have here, to whatever the hell it's called. Okay. And um, when I do a get VM demo one, okay, it gets the contact of uh, demo one or all of them in this particular case. Okay. This is CD drive number zero. So and as long as you don't have too many CD drives per VM, it's all of the CD. So um, looking at the first CD drive, you can see it's connected. If that comes back with anything, you've got connected CDs. Now my ISO is on local storage, and uh, being on local storage, that would preclude emotion. Okay. So um, one of the things you might want to do is to just download it first. This is off. So this particular demo, it says I haven't got one in it. Is it one? But here we go. So this gives me a list of VMs with connected CD. Okay, uh, that's the object VM. I need to manipulate the CD itself. So it's passed through to get CD drive to get the context of the specific CD. Okay, and it's a bit naughty. It throws up a weird, weird error, but it works. Um, I haven't set it to non-connected and not start connected. I just basically said don't use it, and that's what I'm okay. If you don't get the confirm false it'll have to be on the floor. Let's do that. Good. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, if I do the reverse, okay, so get the um, get the drive, set the drive path, ISO path, and this is what we want to it. There's a space between the name of the data store and the name of the file. Um, not that obvious if you've got proportional fonts. Uh, if you miss it out, that's of course sworn I'll put one in and I'll do it in the fast versa. Okay, so this would add a class file called the ISO get. Uh, regardless, uh, start connected just in case you reboot and connect the through because obviously you want it right now. Okay, let's have a look at this again. There she is, and if I open her up, I'm hoping it's easy by now. We're not halfway through this part. Okay. Well, then just prove it's a little VM. And that I actually do typing. So oh, I still need a list of spell. Okay. Uh, on older versions, um, you would just get stuck at the login prompt as well. Um, so I'm just a little bit quick here. But as you can see, it's doing the sysprep. And I'll leave it doing it's going in the back. The good news is this script's finished, so I can actually open up the script that I've been talking about. So, um, what did I call it? I guess properties. Yeah. So, I go to guess properties, so you can come. And I'll connect again. I'll run this by part. It's slows me down. It's basically quite so long. So, I'm still connected. Okay. Let's see if You might get a careful results for what the hell. So, um, if I run this execute here, yeah, okay, so it's powered on. Okay, it's got one, two, three, and off of it. And if I really want to, so I'm not actually running anything right now. Um, so it's nice and big. Do you want to know what other columns there are? Lots. Okay. All that lot. And the body drives, hard disks, and so on. Okay. Memory megabytes. I forgot what it showed by the call. Again. Again. It shows memory gigabytes. That probably is much better than that, um, But it doesn't show the. I think I'm going to see if it's the thing I like always get. Okay. CD drive. Okay. So um, 
be like this, just like that. Show me the one. Okay. And that's everything. Um, somewhere is networking. If I can find it on here. Um, network adapters. There's network adapter one. Doesn't really tell you much about it. And this is where that expand property thing comes in. Okay. So um, it says this network adapters. Okay. And notice it's got brackets. Okay. That's usually the giveaway. It's got an expand. Okay, so you think, oh, want to know a bit more about it. It's got brackets, expand property, and then the name of the column, as you can see here. And if I run that, it tells me it's an E1000 production, the port group it's on, and the MAC address, and all the lines enabled. What it's not told me, okay, um, is the IP address, because that's actually what the guest knows. Um, Look, uh, oh, there's the building, isn't it? Um, once it's finished built, the IP address will appear there. So just bear in mind that sometimes you see you can just get VM block if you can interrogate the VM itself as opposed from the inside as opposed to from the outside. I'll find it, but if I take a look. Oh, it's booting. I'll get some of it in a second. And I'll load this it's workstation on a machine. A reason why that memory does not loads is to take a lot of do this thing. Okay, and yeah. Right, um, let's put it punctually. It's called demo one. And that's its IP address. Let's see if we can get it to agree. Yeah, there we go. So that's agree. Now, um, what version tools? Not what version tools. Okay, nine three double four. Apparently, it's on the slide. Um, let's run that one. And let's create an HTML file. Um, looks like that. Not particularly exciting, but depends what we're in. If I do this one. As it's a CSV, I like the word in that one. It's this one that's kind of nice. Uh, I don't use it in scripts, but it's nice to play around with and try to do. Let's just jump. So, um, <clears throat> I just want to look at something. I don't know if I can have the criteria for what I'm searching for. There's only one VM to point with, but uh, um, you can use it to find things. This is the one I wanted to show you. Um, I can't remember if it's currently got a speed in. Um, so the handle, take it off there. If I just change it back so it's not got one. And then we'll go through this. And this one. So, if I get a list of all my one VMs with connected CDs, it doesn't say anything, then nothing's appeared there. Okay, uh, the next line. Attaches a CD. I'll just prove it actually does that. Okay, so if I run this and it's reconfiguring the virtual machine, and it should say it's on the virtual machine. And if I go to this one, and it's popped up, so you can see there. And we're going to insert in. There she is. And now if I run that first command again, but I can do it again as well. So get all the VMs, all one of them. Look at their first CD. Look at the connection state. What about it? Is it connected? Okay, there's one. And this is a bit fast and dirty, but it works. I'm just clicking the connection state. Well, clicking the attached state. Uh, we should just connect it to the connection. Okay, that's the connection. I should have said what CD, but I don't know. I'm running the script. Okay, and I do have a setting. It's my luck, the script doesn't work. Just as I'm going to go. There we go. Okay, um, probably I'm quicker than the Okay, and it's just going to have to work. 
one of the things we found in scripts uh, that you do have to watch out for is timing. Even when we do async, um, it'll signal it's finished and it's not quite all the way finished. Um, so you might need to put a few sleeps or weights and things in there just to make sure that things come through. I'm going to look, I'm just show my desktop one quick look to see if any Okay, uh, absolutely no problems with people hanging, getting copies of the scripts that I've been writing. For those who've asked, there's quite a few that I've asked. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay, if you ask me nicely through LinkedIn, I'll happily send you them by email. There's nothing particularly nasty about what's in them. Um, let's see what questions you've got. But yes, you can get a copy of my text on file. I'm hoping whoever couldn't hear anything can. Okay. Um, if you've got any more questions, I'm actually looking at the um, chat window right now. Uh, please ask me questions. Um, we're on a few minutes, but uh, if you're going, I'm going. And I hope I didn't speak too quick. But uh, oh, that's great. Um, no one's typing anything or you're typing while I'm chatting. Um, I'll share my desktop again. Um, one of the scripts I, I do use for real. And uh, where the hell is it? The whole one here. Um, <coughs> you can write to files. You can write anything to a file. Okay. So this variable sends set the path that you want to write to and uh, set content basically and add content uh, first line the rest of the lines. Uh, you can write anything into a file. I happen to have done HTML in a particular example. Okay. You can from PowerShell set environment variables. Okay. Permissions permitting and interrogate environment variables, uh, which I do somewhere in the script. Okay. Um, I I that is. Okay. And you can fire things up. Um, one of the new things in Power to Live Version 5 is that I'll stop the same, is that, um, oh yeah, uh, get to the books in a minute, is, is that you can fire up a, a web based console. Um, so invariably I'll do an invoke with the URL with the browser of my choice. Rather than whatever happens to be the default one, i.e. Um, any good books? Yeah, um, if you go to Amazon, and I'll share my screen just a tick so I can show you. But comment it, I suppose, .co.uk. Okay, and our CMI. That's the one. And if I share my desktop, you can see what the hell I'm talking about. And is it one? Yeah, that one. That's a book. It's thick as hell. It's a, it's a huge bit, but um, the these two guys, that the main guys, the right, yeah, main guys I talk to anyway. Luke Dickens and Alan Rimmer are lovely guys. Uh, Alan's the one that writes the blog that was mentioned at the beginning. Um, if you're looking on the internet. For answers, and neither one of those two, what did you mean? Answers it, it's probably exactly right. And one of the cool things are sometimes when you say, how the hell you can do this, maybe PowerCLI doesn't do it yet, it might appear in the next version, and it might be the cause of something you've got in, um, which has happened to me a couple of times. Yeah, it's quite nice. Might not be my particular suggestion, but one of the many that are for people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, if you do a, if you're writing scripts, I would suggest you don't write cold. Um, that you do a network search. Does Power I work with things like SRM and Ops Manager? Um, I don't honestly know. Um, I've not tried. Um, that, that's one of the research, isn't it? Um, it works with cloud. Um, I'm not so sure if it works with SRM. Oh, apparently, yeah, as of March, so yeah, yeah, it's, it happens. 
Um, I think I'm getting a sample, so unfortunately, I'm about to bring it to an end. Okay. Um, again, uh, about the scripts. Uh, my name is Darry Moby. Uh, if I go to the hand here, my email address is Darry.Moby at QA.com. Feel free to drop me an email and I'll, you know, size the mailbox if you're meeting I'll zip them up and then. I'm also on LinkedIn. You can also ask me there. That's more convenient for you. My phone tends to notice uh, LinkedIn more than I do. Email tends to work. That particular email tends to work. Uh, you're more than welcome to have copies of them. Obviously, they only work specifically for the addresses I've got. But I, I've used variables, so um, you should just be able to alter those there. And I hope you've learned something. Thank you very much, folks. And now I'm going to mute. <laughs> Mm-hmm.